begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray together. Lord God, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of each of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. Our Lord, our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. I'm smiling as I'm singing the fifth verse of that song there this morning. Oh, Jesus, always with us stay. Make all our moments calm and bright. Oh, I'd settle for 10 minutes a day of calm and bright. <laughs> I want to begin this morning, actually, with two things. Uh, I want to describe to you a little cartoon, and then I have a small confession to make that when, uh, when I sat down to think about this subject of the church today and uh, what kind of message would be a, a blessing to you, I thought, this is a really yet another example of God's crazy sense of humor because... Being in the moment is something that I'm really struggling with in my own life right now. I'm at that stage in life that I know many of you are familiar with where I am pulled in 18 different directions between working and my kids and the house and the hobbies and the dog and the husband. And, the, and um, a few weeks ago, this cartoon came across my Facebook page and it's I, I wish I could show it to you, but it would have been too much to put the screen down. So I'm going to describe it to you. It's just a little doodle sketch of this woman with a bedhead, and she's in a yoga pose, right? And the little thought bubble says, today I will live in the moment. And then the little words underneath say, unless the moment is unpleasant, in which case I will eat a cookie. <laughs> I eat a lot of cookies. <laughs> Anyway, um, but that's kind of where I want to start today, this idea that it's a real challenge in this world to stay in the moment, right, to really celebrate and enjoy the today that we have. Um, whether it's breakfast time in the morning when I'm, you know, making uh, lunches and breakfasts and trying to get everybody out the door in time and myself out to work and one time uh, recently I was cutting up baguette for lunch and Robin asked for a piece for her breakfast with some butter and jam and so I chopped off a small piece for her and I opened it up and I put the butter on it and, and then I put it down on the counter and I picked up the great piece of log that was left and I handed it to her and she just kind of looked at me and I'm like, oh, right, log back, gave her the piece that I had given her and those sorts of days when I really fear for my sanity when I've dropped them all off at, at school and I have, you know, 15 minutes to get to wherever it is I'm working that day because I'm up, off to work many mornings now. And so I've dropped them off at school. Everyone's on time. They all have their backpacks. They all have their lunches. And um, in my head, I'm thinking, okay, now the end of the day and Pat's going to pick up Charlotte from the babysitter and then we have to get home and dump dinner out because piano lessons are tonight. And I'm all worried about what's coming at the end of the day. And uh, one morning I found myself on the on-ramp to the Highway 400, heading in the wrong direction. Thinking, ah, because you can't really just do a U-turn and turn around and go back the right way. I had to go all the way up the highway to the next exit, turn around and come flying now very late for work down the other side of the highway to get to where I was supposed to be. And that really, in all honesty, was a moment when I went, I need to stop doing that. I need to stop worrying about next hour, next day, next week, tonight. I need to just be where I am. The rest of it will have to take care of itself. It was a real, like, I really, I was so frustrated that day. I thought, here I am going north, and I need to be going south. The idea of, of what we do or how we stay in the moment, what to do with our worries for the future, not even necessarily worries, but our plans for the future. What we do with the past, if you've had a bad morning, and some days I carry that into work with me. How do we manage our pasts and our present and our futures in a healthy way, right? I think this is one of the tasks that come to us as adults. We need to figure out how to fit all of those pieces of our lives together. And I think not only do we do that as individuals, but I think it's healthy to think about that when we are people gathered together intentionally in community. So as a church, we have together a past, and we have a moment now that is our present, and we have a future that lies unrevealed in front of us. And we have to figure out um, how to be healthy in that, right? How not to get so caught up in one or the other that we just miss where we're at. 
So the, the story that I've chosen today um, to look at with you is this, the Old Testament story that Nancy Lee read for us um, out of the book of Numbers. And I'm hoping that this little episode from uh, the life of Moses and God's people together might for us reveal some good lessons about the past, the present, and the future. And I want to ask something of those of you who know this story, because I know many of you know this story well. I want you to try as best you can with me today to forget about what you know about the end of the story and try and just really be in the moment of the story with God's people. I find that sometimes when we read stories in the Bible over and over again and we know the ending, it somehow weakens, it dilutes the treasure that's in the text because we don't read it like somebody who's experiencing it. We read it like somebody who knows it as an old familiar story. So let's try and stay together in this story where we have God's people camped in a place called Kadesh. It's right on the edge of the land of Canaan. And it's been two years and a bit since these people have escaped from Egypt. Two years from that sort of Charlton Heston moment at the Red Sea. They've been wandering around in the desert, living this nomadic life, setting up camp, moving once in a while, not daily, but moving around. And on this day, God comes to Moses and he says, it's time. You need to send 12 men. Pick a leader from each of the ancestral clans. Pick a, a man and send them into this land that I have promised to you. And have them explore around a bit. Find out what it looks like, who lives there, what kind of crops grow, what kind of cities are there. Send them in to do a little bit of an advanced scout. And so Moses does what God asks of him. And then they wait. The 12 men go off into the land and God's people are there in their moments in their present time, waiting. Waiting to hear what it is that these people will have seen. The Bible says 40 days later they come back and a big meeting is called. All the people are gathered around and they can't wait to hear what it is that God's men have to say to them. It's the day, right? This is the day that they have been thinking about. This is the day that has been ahead of them in their future since God first said to Moses that day in the burning bush, I'm going to lead you into the land of Canaan. You're going to lead my people into the land of Canaan. And here they are. It's here. It's today. What do these men have to say? By and large, they agree on what they saw and uh, my version is, I'm quoting out of the uh, New International Version, but it's more or less matches. It says, we went into the land where you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's its fruit. But the people who live there are really powerful, and the cities are fortified, and they're large. And we even saw descendants of Anak there. And for those of you who don't know that reference, and I had to look it up, Anak is sort of a... Uh, a historical person who was legendary in his size and in his power. So what they're saying is there are these really, really big people who live there. These big, strong people are the inhabitants of this land. They're giants. That's the report they get. And then there they all are, gathered in that moment, and they have some choices to make. They have to listen to everybody's opinion, and they have this conversation, and I, I can just imagine it. It's this raucous, big gathering of people, and everybody wants to say something. And there are 10 men who say, you know, it's too scary. They're too big. They're too powerful. We can't possibly defeat them. Do you really think we can move forward? Yeah, it looks great, but man, we've got a lot of work to do if we're going to take over this land. And then that's 10 voices. And then on the other side, there's these two men, Joshua and Caleb, who say, yeah, the land is great, and they're big, and they're scary, and we've got a lot of work to do if we're going to take over this land. But we've got to go forward because God is with us, and we can't rebel against what God wants us to do. We've got to trust that God knows what he's doing. Forward ho. And there's this great, big, like, I'm trying to imagine how that sort of meeting went. 
and I've been to enough sort of raucous meetings in my life to know that it probably got pretty exciting, you know. We can, we can't, we can, we should, we shouldn't, they're big, so what? Let's go, let's not. And the people want to stone Joshua and Caleb and they want to stone Moses and Aaron for wanting them to go forward. And um, the, the men who are trying to remain faithful to what they believe God is saying, they're, they're ripping their clothes and they're falling flat on their faces, which culturally was just this sign of saying, we really believe that God wants us to move forward. And the people who are sitting there watching all this are, well, what are they in that moment? What are we in that moment, right? We're scared. We're angry. We're confused. We, we don't know what to do. The, heat, the debate is heated. The opinions are diverse. And we are just going, what do we do now? Right, because now is the only time we ever get that choice of what we're going to do. We can't decide what we're going to do yesterday already been done. We don't really, we like to think we can decide what we're going to do tomorrow, but it doesn't take too many steps in this life to realize that our futures are really not as in control of ourselves as we'd like to believe they are. Just when we think we've got it all together, there comes the curveball. We can't decide what we're going to do tomorrow. We can only decide our choices that matter are today, are now, are in this moment, right? So the people have a choice. Who are we going to listen to? Which voice, which camp am I going to belong to? I think that that's a really helpful message, a really helpful picture for us in the church today. It's um, a scary place outside those walls for those of us who are Jesus followers today, right? We're still doing battles with giants. There are lots of challenges. There are lots of things that make us fearful about the future. There are lots of changes in the world around us. Our world is just a different place. Our technology is changing. The way we communicate is changing. The way, the way we relate one to another is changing. What people accept just as a given belief is changing. There are big, scary things out there. We need to decide today what we're going to do about that. So some interesting things happen to the people of God. I love this part of the story where the people kind of gather together, and I kind of imagine that as this, the side meeting or maybe the meeting after the meeting, you know those ones, where they all get together and they say, um, let's just pick another leader and we'll go back to Egypt. It wasn't so bad there after all. I love that. It wasn't so bad there. We were just enslaved for generations. And, but it, it doesn't somehow seem quite so bad in the face of what's in front of us. They're worried about their future they're not really remembering their past very accurately. But they're in the moment, and they need to choose. It's a bit of a cautionary tale, actually. We didn't, we didn't read to the end of the story, because the people, most of them, in that moment, choose backwards. And uh, God's not very happy with that choice. As a result of that decision, God sends them back to the wilderness where they wanted to go. But none of them who were there that day, none of the adults who were there that day, are permitted to enter the land of Canaan. They wander for 40 years until every single one of them, except for the two voices, except for Joshua and Caleb, they're the only people who were in that moment who are also then, a generation later, allowed to cross into the land of Canaan. So if today is the day we have the choices, then what do we do? I, 
I would say to you this, that our work as the church today, in this moment, when we can, as best we are able, put our past in a place where we celebrate it, and we put our future in God's hands, we look to the scriptures. And I think our job as the church today is fundamentally the very same that it was the day Jesus gave the job to Peter. We read that this morning too. When they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, son of John, do you love me more than these? Jesus, uh, yes, Lord, Peter said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. God is patient beyond measure. God loves us as far and as wide as the east is from the West, and that is certain, and that is enough. But we have been given the gift of today, where we have this incredible privilege of choosing what we're going to do with this day, with this moment. We give thanks for where we've come from, we face forward with confidence that God is enough, but today, we need to choose. Thanks be to God. <laughs>